listening to Radio Data, a podcasting radio where we talk about data, cloud, analytics and AI with different guests, different hosts and in different segments. This segment is called Data Journey, where our guests talk about how data moves around in their company, what technologies they use and what value data brings to their products. Radio Data is recorded with passion by Getting Data. Getting Data is a data management company founded by ex-Spotify data engineers who now build similar cloud, AI and data engineering solutions for other companies. Hello everyone. Today my expert guest is Simona Miriam. Simona lives in Tel Aviv in Israel and she works as a senior data engineer at ADOC. ADOC is a healthcare startup from Israel that uses AI to analyze medical images and help uh, physicians to make better decisions. I will be talking with Simona about her work at ADOC, the challenges that she faces there and her experience in using various big data technologies as she has been working as a data engineer for last eight years. Simona, uh, let's start with the introduction. Could you please tell us more about yourself, uh, your company and your daily work? Sure, Adam. Um, So, yeah, thanks. Um, I'm Simona. I'm uh, I'm 30 years old, which feels crazy. It's a new thing for me. So here's to a new decade. I love music. I love traveling. I love data. And these three things really sum me up. Um, So I I am, uh, as you mentioned, I'm a senior big data engineer here at ADOC. Uh, ADOC is a healthcare AI-based company. We're always on AI. Um, And what we do, we actually analyze medical images. So that would be things like CT scans. Uh, And we actually do that directly after the patient is scanned. So then we're able to notify and activate physicians within the imaging workflow. Um, So we provide a really, really broad suit uh, that consists of algorithms for flagging and prioritization of time-sensitive pathologies and care coordination tools for multidisciplinary teams. Um, and we're even FDA cleared. So uh, that, that's pretty cool. And I think that's really why I joined ADOC. I thought, I thought that this idea is, uh, is quite amazing. Uh, but I've been actually working at ADOC for a bit over six months now. Um, so if you ask what I do and what's my role at ADOC, I'm a senior big data engineer with that word big being really important. And I, I think my challenge is, Um, They consist of two things. Um, And to understand these two things, let me take you to that point where you found a startup, right? Because I think um, what ADOC suffers from is what a lot of uh, where even all Israeli and just startups in general suffer from, which is that um, at first, they really want to build that uh, solution as quickly as possible and just provide that product Um, But then they don't really think about scale uh, and they don't really think about their data as much, or maybe they don't have the tools to think about uh, building that data architecture. Uh, And so data accumulates over time, uh, just as it did at ADOC. Uh, And so my two challenges is A, dealing with that data that's already here, um, but then B, also dealing with all of that new data flowing in. Um, And we have several questions that we need answered uh, regarding to all of these uh, data types and all of that data. Um, So how do we store that data correctly? How do we build a data lake using what tools? Uh, How do we provide access to that data to different um, types of consumers? So we have different, different users, right? Different consumers. We have data analysts and data scientists. Uh, We have dev and AI engineers, and all of these have different needs. They need to access that data on uh, different levels of granularity. They have different ETAs, different um, types of algorithms or queries that they need to run. And then how do we run our algorithms on scale? How do we run them on scale so they're optimized? They provide us with the most accurate answer, but also run as quickly as possible. 
And I think just answering all of these questions um, would provide us with that data architecture um, that would best fit our needs that we need. Um, and so that's essentially my role at ADOC right now. I'm, I'm building that data architecture uh, so it would fit ADOC's needs. You mentioned something very interesting that ADOC, like many other startups, has accumulated a lot of data before building a really good data infrastructure. I will likely ask a number of follow-up questions, but let's start with the data part first. What type of data AI Doc stores? Uh, who uses this data and what value it brings to the product that your company is building? Sure. So it's important to keep in mind that the end consumers here are radiologists. Uh, so these are our uh, customers. And uh, um, so the data that we're dealing with are DICOMs. And, and that's really cool and extraordinary. You can find these on different uh, Kaggle uh, challenges, you know, for uh, medical imagery. Uh, and it's what's interesting about DICOMs. And I, I think what, what I'll first say is that if we think about the data world today, most of the companies in the data world are either uh, media companies or fintech companies, and, and they deal with uh, media data. So it's basically most of the time pretty structured, um, and, and you just have to do some aggregations on it. And the challenges in the media world are the scale. So at Nielsen, when I was working um, in my previous position for Nielsen, we were processing more than 50 terabytes of data daily. Um, but the actual processing that we had to do on the data was pretty simple because the data is structured. Um, and when I look at ADOC, the, the volume is not as big, right? Because um, it's not media data. But what's, what's interesting, and I guess also fun about DICOMs is that they're very, very unstructured. You don't know um, what you'll be actually getting what, what, when you're looking at a DICOM file. Um, so a basic file consists of two parts. You have the metadata and you have the pixel data, which is an actual image. And so you have to understand how you're going to process um, the image and the metadata. Um, but you also have to take into consideration the fact that it's so unstructured. Um, it's like, you know, like uh, when you go to a doctor, to your lo local doctor, uh, so you, you might go to two doctors and you might get an entirely different diagnose from both of these doctors or even the same diagnose, but they will write it in a completely different way. And, and like, so it's the same thing with DICOM. So don't really know what you're getting. It's just that, well, this has to do with medical stuff. Um, so that's a lot of the challenges with it. And how are those challenges are impacting the, the solutions that you build? Are your data architecture and data pipelines different than what, uh, for example, media companies are building to analyze the clickstream events? Yes, definitely. Um, I think a lot of uh, the frameworks that we use in, um, in the data world today, like if we look at Spark, um, then a lot of uh, the things that are really cool and fun about Spark, you know, is the fact that you can just do Spark read and you get all that data in a data frame. Um, and at Nielsen, you didn't really have to work that hard for that to happen. We would uh, just store all our data in the data lake in Avro format and uh, um, it was really easy a to do, just like serialize that data in Avro format and then read it later on. Um, and and here, a lot of the work that um, I have to do, even before I start thinking about processing the data, is just investigating investigating the data, understanding the way that it is structured, understanding. How am I going to actually consume it? If I want to use Spark, how am I going to consume it using Spark? And just do a lot of custom actions. Um, and a lot of the times I just research and like, you know, do a lot of Googling and read a lot of things on Kaggle. Um, but things change all the time. So if, even if there was like a, 
uh, Spark package or library that was released some three, four years ago that could process DICOM imagery, it wouldn't actually, it, it's probably not relevant to what's happening today. Um, so yeah, just like dealing with that, just like more, doing a lot more investigations on your data, really understanding what it looks like. Okay, please let me ask. Do I understand correctly that the main difficulty is to apply necessary domain knowledge to properly interpret the metadata of your image files and then read those files in a correct way so that you can actually understand what given image is about before even analyzing it with some AI models. So in other words, the main challenge is not uh, not to use right frameworks such as Spark or Flink or BigQuery, but rather um, to implement actual software code to parse and understand the, the input data. Yeah, definitely. Like when you develop um, a machine learning algorithm, you want to research your data as, as closely as possible. Just understand all the attributes that you have, understand the meaning of these attributes, understand the values that these attributes might get. So um, that includes a lot of research, both on the image part and the metadata part. And since the data is basically unstructured, it involves a lot of just data research. Yes, it, it makes sense. However, you still need to use some technologies to do your job. What are the technologies that you work with on a daily basis? I do a lot of uh, data investigation using Zeppelin. Um, so that's a tool that I've actually learned to um, love at Nielsen. Um, I think that, you know, one of uh, when at, at, at ADOC, we are um, we're using several cloud platforms, but we're also definitely using Amazon AWS. And so when you have AWS, one of the easiest ways to just launch a Spark cluster would be just launch an EMR. Um, and you have you have that uh, possibility to use Zeppelin on EMR. So I love uh, I love doing my uh, on scale investigations um, using Zeppelin. Um, so definitely that one. And it's just the fact that um, I'm still doing a lot of investigations on that data in order to build the data architecture. So yeah, definitely Zeppelin. So it's Zeppelin, Spark, EMR, all of them you use today. And what are uh, the new technologies that you think you will be using in the future? I would really, really love to investigate uh, DBT. I heard a lot of really good things about it uh, in regards to data transformation and just, uh, you know, delegating a lot of that transformation work to, to data analysts. Um, and I think that would do a lot, of, a lot of good for ADA. Um, and then also in regards to data workflow management. So uh, at Nielsen, I was using Airflow and I grew to love Airflow, um, especially to, compared to AWS data pipeline. Um, but then uh, I, recently I heard a lot of really good things about Preset and Daxter. Uh, and so I'd really want to do some benchmarks and compare uh, and compare these. Uh, so that's another thing. What else do you think it's good to evaluate or benchmark at ADOC? There's like so many things I want to benchmark. Okay, yeah. Uh, another thing, of course, is of course, um, what tool to use uh, when you build the a data lake, right? Because uh, when we talk about data lakes, you really have to understand that requirement. Do you need your, um, in, in, in terms of data updates and deletes and, and, um, and all of that. And at Nielsen, our data lake, it was pretty basic in terms that um, the data format that we were using was Parquet. Um, um, and then, uh, towards the end of my term at Nielsen, uh, I started investigating Delta Lake and I just fell in love with that project. Um, but now I think I'd really would love to compare Delta Lake and Icebear because I heard a lot of good things about that project and it's getting a lot of attention from the community. Um, and I heard that a lot of the pitfalls of Delta Lake, like just in managing the log files, 
um, and um, file compaction, the small file problem, all of these things. I heard that they have really good solutions in Iceberg. Um, so I would really love to do a comparison between uh, these two. Um, and I think, yeah, that's one of the advantages for uh, when, when, just like when you get to build a data architecture from scratch, that you don't have to replace one thing with another. You can actually just test everything and, uh, well, in terms of what's possible. Um, to test all of these interesting technologies that are getting a lot of attention and um, um, see what really fits your needs. You mentioned that Apache Iceberg is a technology that you would like to try out. For those who don't know, Apache Iceberg is a special format that you can use to store your analytics data sets. Uh, for example, you can use Iceberg to store your data sets in S3 and then query them using Spark or Presto. In this sense, it's similar to Hive Metastore, but it provides uh, many useful features like schema evolution, automatic partitioning, data compaction, version rollback, and so on. And Apache Iceberg was originally developed by Netflix, but it's used by many other companies uh, today. One of them is actually Shopify, and we talked about it with Victoria Bukta, uh, who works as a senior data engineer at Shopify, uh, during one of our previous episodes of our podcast. So I recommend everyone to, to find it and listen to it. Uh, Victoria will be also speaking about how they use Apache Iceberg at our Big Data Tech conference in late April this year. So I'm sure this would be a very practical presentation based on her real-world experience. And Simona, uh, you will be also speaking at this conference with your presentation. Could you please tell us more what would be the topic of your presentation and what the audience can learn from your talk? I first want to say, though, that I'm sure that the talk about Iceberg would be amazing, and I'm planning to attend it. Um, last week, I was uh, speaking at Subsurface Live, and there were a lot of talks about Iceberg and just a lot of talk about Iceberg in general. Um, so, yeah, as I said, it's just getting so much attention from the community. So it's definitely a project worthwhile uh, to follow. Um, so in my talk, though, I won't be talking about the challenges of, um, of Iceberg versus Delta Lake, but more of the challenges of uh, understanding the way that your, um, the, your data goes through in a very, very complex, uh, a very long architecture. So my, my talk is about data auditing and answering the lifelong question is at the end of the day yet. Um, um, and in, the gist of this talk is the fact that at Nielsen, we had a very robust architecture. So um, I told you we were processing more than 50 terabytes. Uh, it's 60 now, 60 terabytes of data daily. Um, and the way that our architecture was built, we had a lot of producers. Um, so a lot of producers pr producing the data to regional Kafkas and replicating that data to the one Kafka on AWS, uh, consumers pushing that data into a, del into a data lake, um, and then more Spark processors reading the data from the uh, data lake and pushing it to different data stores. Um, and because that architecture has a lot of components and each of the components has a bit, has its different set of problems, you know, your applicators and Kafka and Spark and Spark streaming and, and Spark batch processing, um, we didn't really have that um, knowledge and like that visibility in regards to what were the implications of all of these problems on our data integrity. And, and that's a really big problem because essentially Nielsen is a data company and data integrity is very, very important. Um, so not knowing if you have a data duplication or data loss after a crash, that was becoming quite a huge problem. Um, and then also we, we had a thing with uh, our data processors because as I said, in the media world, we do daily aggregations. So you want to run your processor only when the entire data from yesterday is already in your data lake. 
but how do you know when it's in there? Um, so that was a really big uh, thing for us. Like, I remember when I got to Nielsen, it was uh, late 2016, and they were already discussing that, that question, like, how are we going to figure out that it's already the end of the day? How are we going to do that? And I, I actually only designed and implemented this project in like beginning of 2020. And that's crazy. Like just understanding how, how are you going to do that? Um, especially when dealing with the, these massive, the, the massive scale of data. And you probably like asking yourself, why didn't she just ask Kafka? Like Kafka has a knowledge in regards to all the producers and consumers, like what's going on? But no, they don't provide you with that information. They provide you with the amount of bytes um, that are passing through Kafka, but not with the actual number of, of messages um, and their dates. Um, so I think the um, I think that's really just really interesting because um, what you gain from my talk, in my opinion, um, is really because I, I really walk you through the design process and and just designing that data auditing system. Um, so I think you can just take it um, and implement it for your own company, just understanding what should I take into consideration when I design such a system? Um, how do I identify all, all of my producers and consumers? And how do I store that data? How do I eventually query that data? Um, so all of that, that sounds pretty trivial, but these were complex uh, questions for us. Um, so I, I hope that it brings good for other people. Yes, uh, definitely it will bring good for other people as well, because uh, having trust in your data is extremely important if you would like to build a data-driven product or a data-driven culture. And of course, many companies face similar challenges regarding data auditing, data quality, data integrity, data duplication, or even data loss after the crash, as you mentioned. So uh, I'm sure that they will learn from your experience and use this uh, knowledge to improve their data auditing solutions or even build them from scratch. And of course, then the more mature your company is, the more important data auditing becomes uh, for you. I think that um, in, in this case of data auditing, it's sometimes you're uh, too much of a special snowflake to get an actual open source solution to fit your needs. And most of the time, I really don't say that. I, at ADOC, I say all the time, like let, let, you don't have to be a special snowflake. We don't have to do multi-processing in Python. We can just use Spark, like everything's fine. Um, but in that case, um, I think that we did the solution that was best for Nielsen. Um, and it was really amazing to see the gain that we got from it at the end, because um, we built alerts based on the data that we got. And these alerts were popping up faster than you know any of the alerts that you get from Spark Heartbeat or like um, Kafka brokers crashing. Like, the channels in Slack that got the messages from the data auditing, auditing subsystem were the first ones to alert, like there's something wrong. And I'd be like, guys, like, I think your data loaders are not working anymore. Like there's something wrong. It was just, just amazing to see. Absolutely. Simona, now I would like to thank you for this conversation and for the knowledge that you shared with us today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. If you are interested in new episodes of Radio Data, please follow us on Acast, Spotify and other podcasting platforms. Also visit gettingdata.com to find more information about other ways that we gather and share the knowledge. Music